Okay, this morning's reading is taken from uh, John uh, chapter 8, verses 2 to uh, 11. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground at this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Wonderful. I'm wonderfully read. Thank you so much, Alison. I'd like to invite Alan to come to speak to us about that passage now. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Adam. Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to have you with us here today in church and online. Um, yeah, a few... Uh, weeks ago, now quite a few weeks I think, wasn't it, that um, Boris got up with this uh, faithful um, announcement that we were starting to emerge from lockdown. I wonder how that experience has been for you. Um, it's been a testing time in many ways, hasn't it? Uh, some people feeling as though we're not doing I enough stuff fast enough, others feeling as though we need to be more cautious and concerns being raised about what the implications of that might be for us and all sorts of, of um, inconsistencies you might call it, hadn't you? Um, do we or don't we wear face masks at the moment? Even in church here today there's, there's a mix um, of responses. Even um, mirrored in government, isn't it? Um, there we have probably seen in the papers this week, uh, Michael Gove uh, went for his press a manger slap up lunch um, with uh, no face mask and then uh, uh, Rishi Sunak went um, with uh, a face mask on. Do we or don't we? So many inconsistencies around at, at the moment like that, aren't there? And it just makes us just really wonder what is right and what is wrong? And I think it's during these times when we're being tested so much that it pushes our Christian character at times. And I've always been very struck each week as we've come to share the, the time of confession together that for me, I don't know whether you felt this too, but it's felt as though it's had a much deeper significance that I have been pushed, I have been more sinful at times than I otherwise would have been. I felt myself getting more angry and frustrated with circumstances, becoming lacking hope, becoming more depressed feeling at times. It's been heavy at times coping with, with all of this kind of stuff. Um, and, and of course, inevitably, during those times, we've messed up, haven't we? We've found ourselves um, letting God down and feeling a sense of shame and guilt about that. And if that's been you and you've had that experience, know that God loves you that God forgives you, that God can remove your sin as far as the east is from the west, that God can bring that healing and restoration completely. And if you're struggling to receive that and believe you are worthy of that, be reminded today that Jesus suffered and died, but in doing so won a great victory for us on the cross. Now, as a, a follower of Jesus, I don't want his suffering to being in vain. I want to partake 
fully in that victory he's won for us. Don't you too? Don't you want to be victorious people in your lives and partake fully in that? To do that, know his healing and his restoration and his forgiveness in life. And that's why we've been doing this uh, series on the fruit of the Spirit. Because we see what for some might be a negative experience as a positive opportunity to grow that it's often during the most testing and difficult times in life that we can grow the most, isn't it? When things are all going well, uh, actually we can drift away from God all the more, can't we? And become very self-reliant and, and we can grow dry in, in our spirituality and our belief and following of God. But when, he's, when we're going through those tests, these are real opportunities for us to grow. And uh, we've been looking at the, or at least we've been inspired by this passage from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And we, we started back there looking at love all that time back, all those weeks ago. Um, all you need is love was the, the Beatles song on the day I was born, actually. That was number one in, in the charts. Um, and that's a great starting point, isn't it, actually? That love is the thing that holds all of this together, ultimately. And we looked at uh, John 15 and verses 9 to 15. But the, the main thing was, remain in my love. You remain in my love if you keep, keep my commands to love one another. And the next week, Adam spoke about joy. Um, as we persevere, looking at James chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, he said, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. And then we looked at peace. Or I was at peace, you might say, in more ways than one. Um, and, and what brings you peace? What even takes away your sense of peace? And uh, you may remember I reworded the government advice at the time to, to give us something to help us in, in gaining peace and offering peace, to live in the present, to look at the bigger picture and to spread peace. And then the following week, Helen, I'm going to say Helen Nicole, as she was then, yesterday she got married, she's now Helen Dowman. Congratulations, Helen and Michael, on your wedding day. Uh, fantastic to uh, join with that. Um, and, and she, at our all-age service, challenged us um, to shine out like stars, in, as light in the world. Uh, the next week I had patience in more ways than one. Um, and um, you may remember I talked about the parable of the barren fig tree. And um, I talked about my little olive tree in the garden, actually, which I've tried my best to, um, to kill over the winter by forgetting to water it. I left it in the porch. Um, and then, of course, as soon as the summer came and moved it outside, all the leaves went yellow and dropped off. And I thought that was it. But I cut it back and miraculously new growth started appearing. And in fact, if you go in the vicarage garden now, you can see it's really flourishing. All branches have appeared in whole new places. Um, out of a, a difficult experience has sprung new life and new growth. And the following week, Adam talked to us about kindness. And I love the phrase that he used there. He said, imagine the kindest person you have ever known. Um, now know in your heart that God is infinitely more kind than any person ever could be. I think uh, we, we talked about um, uh, God's kindness to us looking at uh, the passage from Matthew 7, 9 to 11. Um, the following week I was good. Was I? I don't know. Um, thank you. Um, um, anyway, I brought goodness at least uh, to us through the story of the Good Samaritan. And the key point was, um, it is one thing to know what the will of God is, but another to do it. And I think this link between um, uh, knowing the will of God, but actually carrying it out, um, our beliefs shaping our actions really clear. And then we had an amazing all-age service. Don't we? It feels like a bit of a kind of a, a, a reflection back, isn't it, on lockdown, many of this, as we're remembering the journey uh, that we've been taking during that time. And uh, in that old age, our young people use the parable of the lost sheep um, to remind us about um, our actions um, and our witness and how we can share God's love and lead others into a relationship and recognising that everybody needs to know that love of God in their lives. And then last week, a significant week in the life of Christ Church, wasn't it? That we returned back to our services 
um, in church again. And we're continuing here this week, but uh, at that time, very much um, remembering the faithfulness of God to his people, including us during this time of lockdown, um, but also looking at how we can grow in faithfulness. And that verse from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 31, the, the time when the Israelites were, were, in a sense, working their way out of their lockdown as they were leaving the wilderness and entering the promised land. Um, and, in, and that promise to us from a faithful God that the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. What a word that is for us now, isn't it, actually? Does coming out of lockdown feel a bit like leaving the wilderness and trying to enter the next stage of whatever that means with all the fears and uncertainties? There's so many parallels between that passage. We could have, we could have actually looked at that story every week, couldn't we? There was so much that we could learn from it um, week by week. <clears throat> so this week, we're coming on to this subject of gentleness. And what that means for us. And we're looking at this story of the woman caught in adultery who was brought before Jesus. So I'd just like uh, us to think a little bit about that passage that Alison has just read for us. This story of, of Jesus gathering teaching, um, of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, experts in the law of Moses gathering around Jesus. And, and questioning and trying to trap him, trying to catch him out with the kind of question that they did. They brought this woman who had been caught in adultery, a sinful woman, who in the law of Moses would have been, uh, the, the punishment that she could have received would have been to have been stoned to death at that time. And they pulled this woman before Jesus to test him, to test whether he felt it necessary to uphold the law of Moses. What a trap, what a tricky question, isn't it? Fancy being put into that situation. And, and we see in the way that Jesus responded to it, examples of his gentleness at work that I'd like us to consider and reflect on and learn from today. So some points from the passage just to consider. First of all, as I said, it was an awkward question for Jesus. If Jesus were to forgive the woman's sins, then Jesus is saying it's okay to ignore the law of Moses. But if he goes ahead and allows them to stone her, he condemns the poor woman to death. Jesus must have felt angry with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as they were using this example that they brought before him. Not actually for a purpose of justice at all, but as a way to try and trap Jesus, to, in a sense, prove their moral superiority by putting Jesus in a corner that he cannot easily escape from. It's a classic example of Jesus' wisdom at work, isn't it? And if some of you may remember in the story of Solomon, there's a story of how two women um, were arguing over the ownership um, of a baby. And Solomon said, I'll cut the baby in two and give you half each. And of course, the true mother at that point, using wisdom, turned around and said, well, um, let the other woman have it to save the baby's life. The wisdom that was at work there. In a sense, Jesus has been put into this position as well, where he too needs to exercise great wisdom in sensitively responding to this difficult situation he's been placed at. And nobody knows... Um, exactly what it was that Jesus was writing on the ground at that time. Um, some say maybe it was the Ten Commandments. Some say maybe he was just doodling. Um, some say maybe, you know, he was uh, using this to point out other sins other than the sin of adultery. We don't know. Um, it may even be the origin of the phrase that you may have heard, uh, to draw a line in the sand. You come across that phrase, yes, that maybe came from this particular story. And Jesus' Jesus's answer was risky, wasn't it? He said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. In John 8, verse 7. Um, what if one of them had decided to throw a stone at her at that point? Um, what might have happened? She may have been stoned to death right there in front of him. Um, the point is, when you point a finger at someone, bear in mind there are three other fingers 
pointing back at you. Think of that sign, yes? Jesus is making them aware of their own sinfulness. The story doesn't mean adultery doesn't matter. We know that forgiveness is not the same as tolerance. Being forgiven does not mean the sin doesn't matter. Forgiveness means the sin does matter, actually. But God is choosing to set that sin aside. The sin that matters even more, um, as the rest of chapter 8, if you read on in chapter 8 of John, makes clear, is the sin of using God's law to make yourself out to be righteous. And that's what Jesus was tackling in his response here. Then the purpose of the law is to shine a light into the dark places of the heart. And so by confronting sin, Jesus is putting himself in the firing line quite literally because this story comes at the start of chapter 8 and we know at the end of chapter 8 there is an attempt to stone Jesus himself. But the story continues to unveil Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in the way that he handled uh, this situation. The temptation there is to lose our temper when we face intense provocation, isn't it? Whether we're facing major trials or minor trials. And this is an opportunity for self-evaluation in our lives. I wonder, um, like Jesus challenged them at that situation, do we need to challenge ourselves? So I've put together um, a few fantastic quotes from the book of Proverbs, just to kind of give us a moment to reflect and think how we stack up against these various uh, points. What about this one to start with? A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. A man of knowledge uses words with restraints, um, and a man of understanding is even-tempered. Or well, fools give vent to their rage, but wise bring calm in the end. An angry person stirs up conflict, and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. And some gentle words. A gentle answer can turn away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And I love this one particularly. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle, um, and, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Gentleness is a fruit of the spirit that grows in us along with the other fruits. As we grow in love and joy and peace, etc., we develop gentleness towards one another. It's an outworking of it, isn't it? And that's why we're thinking about gentleness today. Um, that Jesus' manner towards um, this lady, this girl that was brought before him in the act of adultery, um, in front of this crowd of the teachers and the law and the Pharisees, um, shows Jesus' gentleness at work. So the first thing is to be gentle when provoked. If you notice in the passage, actually, it says in verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, starting with the older ones first. Perhaps, perhaps the older ones in that crowd had lived life longer and were a bit more aware of their own failings, and, and quickly that came to mind. And There is something about the, the self-righteousness in people, isn't there, that as we get older and we realise our failings, actually, we get a bit more aware of those kind of things. In a sense, we do mellow out a bit more sometimes, don't we? Um, our gentleness needs to come from our humility of our own weaknesses. I remember a few weeks ago in these talks, I talked about the subject of kindness, to be kind and gentle, are two topics that link well together, aren't they? And I told of a lady um, who, at the bottom of her email signatures, always had this same message. She said this, be kind to everyone because you don't know what battles they are fighting. So be ready to be gentle when provoked at this time. And the next point is that gentleness is a powerful witness. 
more persuasive to be gentle than to be forceful. Think about the ability to share our faith and the words in 1 Peter 3.15 where it says always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, maybe it's not the leaders and the speakers in churches who have the biggest influence on people. Perhaps it's the Christians who the show love, joy, peace, and gently explain why they do what they do and what they believe in. St. Francis of Assisi is often misquoted as saying, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. He actually didn't actually say that, although I don't know why for some reason that's used. What he actually said is what we've got here on the screen. He said, it's no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. There's something about the manner in which we live that speaks of what we believe. A sense we behave what we believe, don't we? So I'd just like to finish with a little story. It's the story of the North Wind and the Sun. The North Wind boasted of great strength. The Sun argued that there was a great power in gentleness. We shall have a contest, said the Sun. Far below, a man travelling a winding road, and he was wearing a warm winter coat. So, as a test of strength, said the Sun, let us see which of us can take the coat off that man. It will be quite simple for me to force him to remove his coat, brag the wind. So the wind blew so hard that the birds clung to the trees and the world was filled with dust and leaves. But the harder the wind blew down the road, the tighter the shivering man clung to his coat. Then the sun came out from behind a cloud. The sun warmed the air and the frosty ground. The man on the road unbuttoned his coat. And the sun grew slowly brighter and brighter. Soon the man felt so hot, he took off his coat and sat down in a shady spot. How did you do that, said the wind. It's easy, said the sun. I lit the day. Through gentleness, I got my way. See, being gentle and shining with love and joy and peace, all the fruit of the Spirit can have a greater impact in this world. And we know we're at a time when the world needs that. If you're trying to rebuke or direct or persuade or help someone, it can have so much more impact if you're able to do that gently. So let's pray for a moment now and just say, God, help me to be more gentle. To know your love and kindness to me. Thank you for the gentle way that you've dealt with me in my life. And as I face such trials and tests ahead in the days and the weeks and the months, Lord, I pray that you may come close. You may help grow that spirit of gentleness in me, that I may display that and help others to see that in the world. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.